listening to SFP Now. Welcome to another exciting episode of SFP Now. Um, on today's episode, we actually have a really interesting interview with a um, film producer as well as YouTube content producer, Adi Shankar, who was actually involved with um, the Dread movie and uh, quite a few other interesting movies uh, to boot. Um, he's also the person behind the, um, the the new sort of like animated series which is coming to Netflix called Castlevania. So, you know, we're going to be talking to him momentarily. And now it's time for our interview. I'd like to welcome movie, TV producer, actor, and, uh, you know, basically artist, Abhi Shankar, to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it's, it's, it's great having you on. Um, I think the first thing I really want to ask you is, um, how did you actually get into producing movies and shorts? Was it something you always were leaning towards, or did you kind of fall into it via other creative outlets? Uh, I, I think I... It's hard to say, you know, I, I, it's something I always wanted to do. It's not because I really liked movies or anything. Um, you know, I, I ultimately just looked at, looked at, I looked at movies as just a communication tool um, and, you know, to communicate ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where it came from. It was just like I wanted to communicate and this is the way to do it. Cool. Um, you know, what, one one of the movies that you were involved in back in 2012 was the um, was the second uh, attempt at, at Judge Dread, um, using quite quite involved with, in Dread. And um, I've got to say, as 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 a fan, I was really sorry that he didn't uh, take in 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 America uh, for whatever reasons. Um, but I'm just wondering if you you think there's any hope for it um, in terms of maybe a Netflix series or or something. Yeah comment on that um but here's here's what i will say right i think um it's been interesting what's been happening over the last year basically because like r-rated content r-rated superhero stuff went from being this like weird niche of pure thing to all of a sudden it was a it's you know it, it's becoming more and more mainstream mm-hmm. which is which has been interesting to watch it, it is. It's kind of fascinating because back back in our day when when we were growing up, so like I'm, I'm guessing that you you like like myself, you was a child of the eighties and nineties. Um, exactly. When 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 we had sort of things like Terminator and uh, and Judgment Day, and and uh, mm-hmm. and all those films that were sort of like uh, eighteen and R ratings, and they always seemed to do well. And in so like it was kind of like. In the two, in the noughties, things kind of got dumbed down almost. Absolutely. I mean, I think I think that's when you know globalization really became a fucking thing. I don't know if I can swear on your podcast. I apologize. If I can. It's cool. But you know, that's when globalization became a thing. That's when when uh, corporations really started taking over, right? I mean, like the movie studios. You take you take like the Hollywood movie studios. They were they were they were owned by people, right? And they were run by artists. Um, and then all of a sudden, now it's you know, then it was. Seagrams, then it was General Electric. They came in and started. It was Viacom. They came in and started buying these entities because because of uh, because these were powerful entities, right? They were they were they were entities that were able to communicate ideas to the masses. And they and I think a lot of these conglomerates realized, like, man, if we can just control this, if we can if we can sculpt it into being exactly what we want it to be, so that we can perpetuate the idea of the consumerist mosh pit. Mm-hmm. We can dumb down society so that we can, we can we can take everything that's great about art and strip it down to its bare essential. Uh-huh. So that's not really art anymore. It's literally a product. Yeah, I, I'm that's with... kind of what happened in the 2000s. Yeah, I'm I'm with you there. I'm, I'm a musician myself, so <laughs> so you know, right. so like it's yeah, happened. Like what happened to music? Right? Exactly. I mean, like, you know, um, uh, what kind of music do you play? 
Um, I'm kind of like a uh, rock, blues, jazz, um, not really mainstream as such. You're kind of dabbling in all sorts of different styles. I'm a guitarist. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, what's interesting to me is like, I love the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> I, I think what they do is fascinating. Uh, and NSYNC, what they did was fascinating because there's this whole genre of music that's designed to make you feel inadequate and promote the idea of consumerism. Mm-hmm. They took that genre and they made it mainstream. Yeah, but I think... It wasn't a mainstream thing before, right? I mean, you like Michael Jackson and, and Madonna, they weren't really, you know, they were artists and they weren't necessarily promote, uh, uh, perpetuating a, a, a corporate agenda. Mm-hmm. That's, that's true. Um, but, you know, now Madonna would be considered kind of mainstream, you know. Well, whereas... she evolved into um, being mainstream as a survival mechanism, I would argue. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, if you look at if you look at most of the artists today in the world, I mean, they're all... And this isn't me, look, this isn't me trying to shit on people. And all of people are doing this as a survival mechanism. But most of the artists today are sellouts. They've all sold out. Like selling out, remember when we were young, selling out was like a, like, oh man, that guy sold out. He's not, you know, he's not legit. He's not an artist or she's not an artist. They were like, what the fuck? Like, yep. I respected you and now you're doing like commercial nonsense. That's not a thing anymore. There's only commercial nonsense. Mm, that, that's, that's, prob- that's very true. <laughs> um... You know, you know, I've actually uh, done done a few guitar fills for for, for um, sort of this this and that sort of thing for, for money. So you guess you could call me a song out, but by, by the same t- token, I still do my own stuff. You know? mm-hmm. And that's um, and and think that's where you got got to approach it as as an artist, really. You know, do do whatever whatever you can to get by, and then just do your own stuff. You know, exactly. Um, no, exactly. Right, and and like, and that was. That's why that's what what's been so cool about the internet because the internet, in my opinion, is society. It's it, it's it's the culture fighting back. Mm-hmm. Um, as as a as a filmmaker and producer, um, I'm I'm just wondering uh, how much influence would you say you know comic books and video games have had on you insofar as uh, as replicating them on the big screen. Dude, I mean, like literally, that that those are my only influences. <laughs> Again, you're talking to a guy that doesn't really like movies. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm I'm a gamer myself a little bit. You know, I, I love the Drake's Fortune games, and um, I absolutely cursed uh, the moment that they they were announcing a few years ago that Mark Wahlberg was a uh, was up for Nathan Drake. I thought, no, mm-hmm. no, he's wrong for it. <laughs> you know, you know, so sort of like. Um, I mean, I love those games, the, the Drake's Fortune ones, and, um, you know, I also love the Call of Duty playing online and, and, and stuff like that, you know, and, get, and, mm-hmm. get, and getting cussed out by all the Americans. It's quite funny. <laughs> um, but um, another, another question here is, um, and, and, and this is one that um, they, they, they sort of like said that you're absolutely dying to talk about. Uh, we seen um, a new train last week uh, for... The new Power Rangers movie. Now, 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 given that you did a hugely popular Power Rangers thing on YouTube, what what would you say is your reaction to the uh, to the to the trailer for the new movie? Well, I'm back, you know, the movie the movie's out over here. Uh, it's great, you know. It's like it, it was cool, you know. It, it appealed to, to 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 new folks and also people like us who grew up with it. Mm-hmm. I, I've got to confess, I never liked the Power Rangers growing up. I was about twenty when it came out, so. I was a bit old. I think right. I was a bit yeah. old for it. Yeah, you're older than me. Yep. Yeah, but mm-hmm. um, I seen the trailer for the new one, and I thought, you know, it looks pretty cool. You know, I kind of, you know, now I have this thing where I kind of put myself in in the in the body and mind of my ten year old self, and try and look at you know films from that point of view. Um, because I think you have to at, at some point, <laughs> and it, it mm-hmm. did look pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I, I I agree. You know, what's, what's, what's interesting, though, is, is what you just said about how, you know, you weren't really a fan, but now all of a sudden you're, you're intrigued by it. I mean, you're talking to me about it, right? You're like, you're on your podcast talking about it, which means that it's working on some level. It, it, it's, it's doing what it set out to do. It is, but by the same token, I was, I was, you know, I was a huge fan of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which came out around at the same time as Power Rangers, because, you know, the, the old 80s series and Power Rangers were pretty much airing the same time on Sky One here in the UK, if you remember. Um, and I love, the, I love the original Turtles, but I've not liked any one of the movies that they've done on, on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, so, mm. so, so that's... Uh, that, that's uh, no, I mean, I, you know, I, I think the problem with those movies, it was literally like, it, it was alienating to, to our, our demographic, right? Because you're just going for the kids. Uh-huh. 
that was that was the problem there. You know, whereas um, the teenage the the the, uh, the Power Rangers one, it looks like they're they're trying to trying to skew it a little bit more, so it it's so like it it's inclusive of the kids and the adults as well, and that's what I thought was pretty mm-hmm. cool about it. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely, it, um, you know. It's the Pixar formula. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, you hop on, you have a, you watch a Pixar movie, and you're like, "This is great!" Like, you know, you, yeah, this is great. Yeah. Um, like, uh, you know, uh, Wall-E, in my opinion, is one of the best post-apocalyptic sci-fi movies of all time. You know what? I'm still not seeing Wall-E. <laughs> I, I, I'm still not you, seeing. You it. have to see Wall-E. I mean, you know, I love, I love quite a lot of the Pixar stuff, but I, you know, I just thought there's only so much time in the day to sort of like catch up with everything. And, uh, you know, I, I love Cars. I've seen Cars about multiple times. I love that film. Um, I also love Finding, Finding Nemo. Um, and I'm not, I'm not seeing Finding Dory yet, the, uh, the sequel, but, you know, sort of like it's, uh, I, I love some of the Pixar stuff, so you know. But I got to see Wally. You know, based on what you just said, that it's been like the best post-apocalyptic sci-fi ever made. I've got to check it out now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. It's, I mean, if you're into apocalyptic sci-fi, Wally is literally better than a lot of the classics. <laughs> I would argue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you know, sort of like um, I think the original Day the Earth stood still is going to take some beating. <laughs> That's probably my benchmark for for um, for, for, for a sci-fi narrative, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, a pro a project that which is non-sci-fi that he was involved with um, was The Grey, which starred Liam Neeson. And you know, from what I've seen of that film, the the locations and the wolves and 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 everything, you know, the action, the fact it's this big survival epic. Uh, what would you say was the most challenging aspect of filming that? Because it's you know it's it, it looks it, it's quite had had quite a an epic feel to it and, and scale. Interesting you say that because it was you know it was a it was a completely indie project without distribution up front. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think that you know, the the uh, the right the uh, the writer director of that Joe Carnahan like uh, you know I, I literally I was a fan of his. Um, since I was in college, actually, which is really crazy, you know. Um, I, I I don't know if you've seen. Have you seen Smoking Aces? I I, I did watch it quite well. That that, that had um, the uh, the guy from Star Trek in, right? Um, the I, I forget his name. The guy that plays Kirk. Chris Pine. Yeah, Chris uh, Pine. Is his name, and um, he was in it. It's more of a cameo. Um, it starred Ryan. I mean, Ryan Reynolds is like the main dude. And then, spoiler alert, Ben Affleck just kind of gets whacked, like, part of the way through. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think think around about that time, the time that was made, everyone wanted to see Ben Affleck get whacked part of the way through after Daredevil, so... Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Although, to be honest, I, mm-hmm. I didn't think Daredevil was that bad. <laughs> you know? Oh, the Daredevil movie? You didn't like the Daredevil movie? I, I thought the Daredevil movie was all right. You know, it, it, was, it was nothing, nowhere near as dark as the comics, obviously, but we thought for a superhero you movie... See the, uh, okay. Did you see the director's cut? I did, yeah. And the director's cut was even better. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's, I think, you know, I think a lot of movies actually suffer from that, where there's, like, a director's cut, and you're like, whoa, why was this not the thing that was released? Um, mm-hmm. And I think that original Daredevil movie was, was like, literally a victim of that. Because you, you watch the director's cut, and you're like, there's more going on here, you know? Um, and, and to a large degree, uh, that's kind of, in my opinion, why I think the, the, uh, the Daredevil TV show on Netflix worked so much. Because Daredevil's just one of those characters where you just needed a lot of time. Because there's so many facets to what the guy does, right? Like, if you mm-hmm. just focus on him being a lawyer, then people are like, okay, cool, this is a weird legal drama. If you just focus on him being a superhero, then you're like, he's a blind Batman? Yeah, and what? then... And, and like, then... he's a Spider-Man who's not really funny? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like, a lot of these characters, <clears throat> especially the minor characters, because they're, they're really complex, right? They're, they're, they're minor characters because they're not... There's something about, like, Superman is super mainstream, right? Because he's, everyone understands Superman. They're like, okay, he's, 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 like, most, he's like, basically God. Cool. Mm-hmm. I, I get Superman. The world gets Superman. So he, he's very easy to digest for a little kid or for an adult because you go in knowing what the deal with Superman is, right? Um, Batman is, as I would argue, a very complex character, incredibly complex character. But because he's, again, one of the first superheroes ever, um, that complexity came more from reinterpretation than from who that character originally was, right? Because the original Batman was just basically the shadow. And then all of a sudden, 
layers get added, layers get added. Um, okay, now he's interacting with with Superman, Superman's action comics, Batman's detective comics. Okay, so then Batman takes on this detective, potentially noir vibe, only for Frank Miller to come in with Dark Knight Returns, uh, yeah, Dark Knight Returns, and then just completely, you know, disrupts the idea of what Batman is, and then by proximity, it, it kind of makes you view Superman through a different lens. So then, you know, I would argue a lot of these mainstream characters, depth was added over time, right, with a lot of these B characters, your um, the complexity was always there. It's just they're in the background, right? And and eventually, now some of these B characters, like uh, case in point Wolverine, who mm-hmm. was a B character, who was a niche character, who was almost a throwaway guy, and you could argue the same about Gambit. All of a sudden, there's or even the Punisher. Then all of a sudden, there's like this cultural shift that makes them super popular. You know, and I would argue that this, you know, what we were talking about the corporatization of art and entertainment and. And, and comic books um, led to the rise of Iron Man, right? Because Iron Man was like a D to F list character at any other juncture in history, right? Like no one cared about Iron Man. It was a guy who built a suit of armor and flew around that made no sense. Yeah, it's a zombie. I've got to admit. In, in a in a in a in a, in a post Apple post Paris Hilton TMZ world where we're all interconnected, and all of a sudden, like fame is the thing people want, not you know, uh, fame and money are the things pe- people people want, or at least are, are what people are told that they should want mm-hmm. or that these are things that people should aspire to, to, to try to achieve. All of a sudden, Iron Man becomes the most popular character in the world. Yep. But it's not because he's a superhero. It's because he's a billionaire and he's famous and he does whatever the hell he wants. Mm-hmm. He's a cross between Steve Jobs and Batman. Uh, that's, uh, that's exactly oh. it. I um, mean, I've got to admit, oh. I, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't have um, thought to have picked up an Iron Man comic or watched an Iron Man cartoon, but I went to see the movie and that kind of got me interested in the character. Right. And what exactly got you into the character when you saw the movie? I don't know. I just kind of liked the fact that it was a bit of a smart ass and he was getting away with it. <laughs> you know, you know the, the, the kind of absolute cheek of the character, you know, the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, you know, I, I kind of liked that in, 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 in characters, you know, a character that's really charismatic. I mean, my, my favourite Star Wars character, is, for example, it's not Luke Skywalker; it's Han Solo. You know? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, Sam. Uh, yeah, I, I can see that. If you're, if you're into smart asses, you're gonna like Han Solo. Mm-hmm. And right. uh, you know, and, and the thought the, the original Han Solo, not the not what he evolved into later. Yeah, um, you know, not the dead Han Solo. <laughs> you know, yeah, but you know, these characters they 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 grow up. It's just kind of what happens. Mm-hmm. People grow up. But I also like the I like the relationship between between R- Rody Ro, you know the the the, uh, the colonel in the army and um, and 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 Tony Stark. I like the way that played, mm. you know, on on, over the, on on the screen as well. Um, but I can see what you I can see what you're saying. Like it's sort of like he's basically Steve Jobs crossed with Batman. <laughs> That's, mm-hmm. you know, um, but I just like the I like the fact that he's he's smart and he's clever. And he's got he's got the money to to sort of like uh, do do all the things that he wants to do, you know, and that, and that that for me is pretty cool. <laughs> another question, another project that you're working on now is uh, you're working on a, a, a TV series for Netflix um, based on the Castlevania games. Um, what what can you tell us about that? I mean. Did you play the Castlevania games? You know, have you, have you come to it from 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 point of view of someone that's actually played the games and you've kind of always wanted to adapt it, or or did, did that just sort that now? I'm a massive, I'm a massive, massive, massive fan of Castlevania. Yeah. I, I remember playing the first one when it came out. I think it, I think the first one was Mega Drive, right? Yeah. So it goes back to the days of the old Sega Mega Drive, and I remember enjoying the first one. See, the first one, the, the first one I played was actually on the Game Boy. It was on the what? Game Boy. Oh wow! <laughs> so it, it does go back a while. Um, what, what? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I remember uh, that was the first big thing my parents ever got me. I mean, we didn't we didn't have a lot of money when we were young, but I remember like I really wanted a Game Boy, and I had a dream one day that I woke up my, and I was like, "Mom, you got me a Game Boy," and they're like, "No, we didn't." <laughs> <laughs> That's my crazy. parents. I think they felt so bad that they're like, "Oh, we, we got you a Game Boy." <laughs> and then I got addicted to it, and then they were like, "Oh my God, what have we done? We've ruined you." Mm-hmm. Only two years later, they like actually. I think getting you a video game, just getting you video games, was like the greatest thing that ever happened. Because mm-hmm. now you make like crazy art inspired by video games. Yeah, um, I got to admit, I had a Game Boy, um, but 
I had I had quite a lot of trouble wresting it from my late mother's hands because she got addicted to Tetris on it. Mm-hmm. So I I never seen my Game Boy ever again. Just mm-hmm. just my, my 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 mother got addicted to it and I never seen it ever again. But what can you tell us about Castlevania? Um, you know, in in terms of um, absolutely nothing. Cause I can't talk about it. You, you can't say <laughs> anything about it. That's awesome. I can't talk about it now. Mm-hmm. You, you do not have any writers attached to it or anything like that? I mean, there's a ton of information on it on the internet, but I can't talk mm-hmm. about it. It's, uh, yeah, it's been, I've been sworn to secrecy. Oh, man. I'm, I'm, I'm quite looking forward to it because I, I, I love things with vampires and, and stuff like that. You know, so. do, you, do you like Warren Ellis, the writer? Um, I, I, I love what I've read of Warren Ellis. I, I've, I've read quite a lot of his, you know, some, some of his dread stuff back in the day. Um, okay, well, finally, what other projects do you have that you'd like to, uh, give a, give a mention to? Because, um, I've, I've noticed that. Yeah, well, you know, there's a, up. there's a really awesome project that I'm releasing this year called, uh, Adi Shankar's Gods and Secrets. Uh, it's a superhero story. Um, and it's really awesome. And, you know, if you're a fan of a- anything I've, I've done, then old well, anything I've done. But if you're a fan of, 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 of the, of, if you're authentically a fan of the, of the genre, I, I designed it for you. Cool. Well, so, yeah. Um, when's that coming out? Do you, is it still, still in production? Is it the, uh, don't have a release date that I can share right now. Um, but it'll come out this year. So it's again the title is Addy Shankar's Gods and Secrets, Gods and Secrets. So um, yeah, just just, uh, just look out for it. Okay, well, well we'll be sure to check that out. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you hopping on the phone with me, um, and uh, hope you enjoy the Power Rangers movie. I I I think I will, um, and um, I'm quite looking forward to seeing what you do with Castlevania. Um, you know, although you can't talk about it too much, I'm looking forward to seeing what you do with it. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Hey everybody, this is Daniel Corey, writer of Image Comics Moriarty and Red City and Danger Cats Ludworth, and you are listening to SFP Now. And I'd like to thank Addy for his time, um, you know, give, giving us this interview and, um, and and giving us lots of interesting insights um, about the, uh, about, in his words, the corporatization of, um, of, of many, of the, many of our favorite franchises. Um, but now it's um, over to um, the TV talk segment and um, we'll be discussing a little bit of news here as well, or rumour. Um, so I'd like to welcome back to the show, Raisa. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks. Okay, well, it's been an exciting weekend for Hubians. Um, Very. Should we, go, should we go straight in with the Dot 2 stuff first? Let's do that. Yeah. Okay, right. Well, this weekend we saw the first episode of um, of, of the temp season of Dot Two Air, the pilot, which introduced um, Pearl Mackey as the new companion Bill. Um, and I don't know; it actually felt very much like um, it felt very much like Rose in a lot of ways. I, and I think I think it was meant to. Um, Stephen Moffat in an interview says that he. He treated it like Rose. He referenced Rose. They, they, they literally wanted to treat it as another pilot. Um, so it's, it's a sort of dub, double entendre. It was, you know, a new pilot launching off point for the series, and the pilot was also the uh, the name of the, um, the alien. Yeah. The, so the, so the, it was both. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily the name of the alien. It was basically a case of what the alien needed. Yes, yeah. Um, needed a pilot. Um, you know, one thing the um, yeah. the, the, the 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 girl, what was her name now? Who who became the pilot? I forget her name. Um, I, I kept looking at yeah, her I, and and kept doing double takes and thinking, could she be related to Karen Gingham? And I kept giving double takes and I thought, no, no, it's not not like a little girl that was in Karen Gingham's in in the first in the eleventh hour. No, be. no, it's somebody else. But she she kind of had um, a slight look about her. Yeah, she did. Of, she did. Of, of Karen Gingham, and I just couldn't get over it. And I thought, well, she's not tall enough. <laughs> no, no. You know, but I, I, um, I actually thought it was quite a confident, strong story, and it was quite, quite, a, quite an unusual weekend for me because, as you know, I usually do the reviews of that too. But 
Um, we actually brought in a new writer, uh, Dominic Walsh, um, to to uh, review the episode uh, for us. He's going to be doing all the episodes um, for, for the season. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I, I'll probably do the Christmas Day one, but he's going to do, do all the episodes for the season. And um, I don't know, I mean, I don't think I would have given the story quite as high a mark as Dominic did, but, you know, I, I felt it was good. It was, it was a solid story. It was it was a solid start, and if they're going to continue to hand us um, uh, contemporary female companions, uh, I thought that Pearl Mackey's Bill was you know an above average variant. She'll do well. She'll do well. I thought she was quite likable, but why? I, I also liked was the fact that she was a lot slower than the other companions. Come to realization, the TARDIS was bigger on the inside. And, yeah. and, and the Doctor and the uh, Nardo made a, a joke yeah. about that. <laughs> yes. It's like, isn't this taking a little longer than it usually does? <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was quite funny. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but what was also nice to see, I mean, we got the nice references to Classic Who with the, uh, with the picture of Susan and all the sonic screwdrivers. Um, yes. In the office, which was which was a nice touch. But what I really liked was when they, when they go into the Dalek battle, and the Daleks are fighting the Mothenians. Mo- 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 yes. I thought, cool, cool, Tom Baker, Destiny of the Daleks reference. Oh, yeah. wow. You know, and that, then I thought that, that's a reference I got right away because, um, you know, I've, I've seen that Mothenian episode, Destiny of Daleks. I've seen that a few times over the years. And, um, yes. You know, and that was actually my... That was actually the first time I actually seen the Daleks in Doctor Who. Oh, cool. Was, was, was that episode, because the genesis of Daleks was made in 1974, right? Uh, yes, that sounds about right. Yeah, well, I I probably only really started watching Doctor Who around about 75, 76, and was becoming cognizant of the fact that, you know, it, this was Doctor Who sort of thing. Um, I was understanding the plots and the storylines and whatnot. Um, and I knew of the Daleks because it was kind of impossible not to know of the Daleks. And I'd actually seen the two um, the two Peter Cushing Doctor Who fil- Doctor Who films that weren't actually canon. Yes, um, yes, were, I remember those. But were based on the uh, were actually sort of like uh, pretty much ripped off from the uh, from from the first Doctor adventures with the Daleks. Mm, um, yes. So for me, that Destiny of the Daleks episode was the very first Dalek episode that I actually seen. So I think that's why when I seen the Mavanians, uh, this song like the uh, the nine year old kid inside was going yes, oh yes, yes. <laughs> you know because that that's you know I, I was like I, I was like nine when I saw my first Dalek adventure of Doctor Who. Sort of thing, and it was one with the Mavangians, and and I remember these Mavangians. I remember seeing them in their their, their tight space suits, and I remember seeing, damn, you know, their their women are hot. <laughs> 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 you know, even even at nine years old, I was actually aware of these with these things. But, oh, wow. but it was um, I I thought it was a great episode, and as soon as I seen it, it ended because I know that Dominic doesn't really have too much classic dot who education behind him. He's seen a few, but not 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 a lot. I sort of like texted him and I said, Dominic, be sure to get the reference to the Mavenians in your review. Cool. You yeah. Know? And and to his credit, he did. Cool. Um, so it's my duty now to um, at some point get hold of a copy of Destiny of the Daleks and sit him down in front of it. So, so, <laughs> so we can watch it. So, yeah. so we can watch because, you know, it's unusual, you know, having Dominic as a writer because he lives about 15 minutes walk away from me, sort of thing. Whereas all the other writers on, at, the, at the site are sort of like his fire and wider, sort of like, um, well, we've got a guy in Lancaster who he writes for us every now and again, uh. um, which is about mm, two hours away from me, probably an hour, truth be told. Um, and everyone else is in is either in the US or Canada, so. So, you know, it's kind of weird having someone writing for the site that lives so close now. So it's going to be fun. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like. You know, it sounds like it's going to reinvigorate my uh, my love of writing for the site and stuff like that, just having someone closer by. That's cool. That's um, cool. So there was that, and um, I, I just loved the addition of Mavenians. My, my nine-year-old, the ni- my inner nine-year-old was doing backflips. It was just so great. Yeah, yeah. And I... 
the problem I had with it is again a contemporary companion, and I and I basically just had to choke down that level of disappointment and deal with the episode and the character on on its on her own terms. Because I, w- I would really like like you, I would like a you know a, a companion from a different time period or a different planet or something. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the thing is, I've noticed um, if you look at uh, at the last at the waning years of the classic Dot Two series, um, the last alien conven- companion we really had was Nissa. Yes, and she was underutilized. I had no clue. Mm-hmm. And then we kind of ended up with um, with with Bonnie Lamford. Oh God. Yeah, and and then we ended up with Perry and Ace. But that uh-huh. said, I thought Ace was a fantastic companion. She was yeah. relative to what they were doing at that point, yeah. And also, he didn't run into Ace, you know, on planet Earth. She was actually in space at the time he ran into her. So, yeah, that's true. You know, that's true. If they insist on use, continuing to use a uh, classic, you know, if they continue to use uh, contemporary companions, maybe... Maybe having run into a contemporary companion who's out out, out in space somewhere or, or or what have you, um, yeah, yeah, just add a bit of imagination to it, or you know. But I'd really love for a peer, you know, for a companion from a different period, from you know, maybe maybe for him to pick up someone from the seventies, yeah. and then bring them to the present day, so they can see that we've got iPads and computers and all all this stuff and. And and uh, it's fact from their will point will view point of view, a computer is sort of like a, a load of bleeding big boxes in a room. <laughs> yes. I think. Yeah. You know that 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 that'd be fun. It's, it just it just be more fun for them to have uh, a companion from 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 the past as opposed to bringing you know continuing with contemporary ones. Um, I mean, there's a few rumors going around actually that Pill Mac is only on for the one season anyway. That would actually make well. I kind of figured maybe she'd get at least part of a second season, if only so that she could be the holdover character for the new Doctor. Because other, mm. otherwise, it's a new companion and a new Doctor. Yeah. yeah. But that, that said, you know, that they, it might be best for them to do new companion, new Doctor under a new producer. Because it That's allows true. a new producer to put his mark on it. Um, mm. But what what what, I, what gets me is, uh, since we've had Stephen Moffat doing Doctor Who, we've not had Captain Jack brought back. No, or, or anything fans like that. miss him desperately, and he wants to come back. You know, and and the fans would welcome him back. They'd love ha- to have happily, him back. Happily. You know, um, but that said, we've had Madame Vaster and the and the Pat, Pat, Patanasta gang. I don't think we're going to see them again. No, I think season. they're done. I think they're done. Um, but it's just uh, it it just seems to me that every time we have a new producer going on coming on, they're not really looking back to the. To, to use anything from the previous incarnations, which is sad, uh, yeah. Because at least in in the classic run of Doctor Who, they 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 went back to use things from the previous incarnations and and stuff yeah. like that. Um, you know, you know, Doctor Do- Who probably do a lot better if it's sort of like uh, as long as moving forward with things, it probably do do better if it was um, also sort of like uh, being a bit more nostalgic as well. Yeah, there, there, there's a way to have a middle ground. Oh, by the way, I quickly looked up, um, the girl's name was Heather. That's right, yeah. Heather, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I remember now. I was I was thinking Eva or something for some reason, but I remember it being heavy, heavy. Yeah, it's, it's probably because of Eva Green. Mm. Yeah, yeah, pro- probably my Eva Green crush. <laughs> uh, oh dear me. So um, you know, Dot Two. Um, how much you would you give it out of ten? Uh, as a start, I would give it uh, maybe seven point five eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, seven point point five or an eight. Yeah. Um, which one? Um, I'll go with eight. Okay. I'll, be, I'll be generous. Yeah, I'd I'd probably go with about an eight as well. Um, I think think it was a fairly strong start. Um, I'm kind of hoping that the series continues along in this vein. Um, it'd be nice to see Moffat be able to top what he did 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 in the last series with uh with 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 Peter Capaldi. Yeah, my my big my big concern in terms of what we're being given is that um, the the ongoing storyline of what's in the vault. Uh, knowing Moffat, that that's going to be disappointing, and I'm hoping it's not disappointing. I'm hoping he's able to buck the trend of his inability to write arcs. I'll tell you what's in the vault: the Master's Tardis. You know that makes sense. Uh, I'll, we'll, we'll go with that as a working theory. That, that's yeah. my that's my best guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about Dot Two, I actually did a, a top ten list of, uh, of of the monsters and villains that I'd like to see return. 
Um, that's over at monstersandcritics.com. So if uh, any listeners want to check that out, head on over to monstersandcritics.com, scroll down their page, and you can see the top 10 monsters and villains that, that, that I think should return. And, and fair, that, fair warning, that list, I helped him compile that list, and it's in, it's uh, compiled by classic Who fans, so fair warning for newbies. Because it's all classic Who stuff. And, in that, and that, that that's a funny thing when Dominic read the list. He was going. He, he wanted some. He wanted some of the. Uh, he wanted the villain from Midnight to appear in it. So I, I oh. had to. I had to explain to him. He says, "Well, you know, the thing is, the list is of classic Dot Who villains that haven't been in the new series yet. That that deserve a shot, sort of thing." Um, although I'm kind of wishing I didn't put the cheetah people down, I kind of put that down somewhere around the middle of the list because I was running out of ideas. Uh. <laughs> you know and yeah also with Sil I got it wrong he actually appeared in the series twice mm. he oh yes he did stories. I remember now yes. uh, but I, I, I I've only really I only rem- really remember the one story that he appeared in that's, well, that's because he appeared um, during the trial of the Time Lord arc and just about everybody was trying to block that out so mm-hmm. that's, that's probably what it don't. was mm-hmm. um so, uh, any on that, any on that list that any any that I didn't include on the list that you think would be good? No, I think I think we got them all. I think we got them all because I think the any of the others, have, you know, like folks like the the macro that were reintroduced in Gridlock, or were were already reintroduced. So I think we've got all the ones that are left. Mm-hmm. And the Mara, you know, and the Mara, the, the, the Mara, the, the Mara, the Mara, the Mara would be a good one because it would be a cheap villain and that mostly it wouldn't be on screen because mm-hmm. it would be a villain where there where it's just being mostly just people acting possessed. And, uh, cause it was, it was interesting when I was, um, when I was, uh, listening to Philip Hinchcliffe presents box set volume three and, uh, uh, Philip Hinchcliffe himself was in the the interviews, and he was talking about the the villains that they did a lot during his era. Um, they tended to gravitate to uh, villains that were just um, allowed actors to act possessed because they had the budget constraints. Mm-hmm. So the, the Morrow would be a good one because um, you you only, you'd only have to see the snake briefly with CGI. Well, don't, don't, C- don't don't even need to use CGI; you could use a real snake. <laughs> That's true. That's you know? true. Um, yeah. That that probably probably, probably be cheaper actually for them to use a real snake than CGI in yeah. it. Um, but one one that got mentioned because I I posted it at one of the uh, one of Doctor Who subreddits on Reddit. I don't know if you've um, have you tried Reddit yet, Risa? No, I I don't. I didn't. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting. Um, I, I I'll have to talk to you about it another time because it's like um, it's a talk about it now. Go into too much detail, but it's. It's basically known as the front page of the internet. And that's what that's what how to market it. And what it is is um, it's kind of like it's like one huge ongoing news feed, and you've got loads and loads of loads and loads of subcategories, uh, which are called subreddits. And I I posted it the link in the doc, in the Doctor Who one, and one of the uh, one of the people that 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 read it and uh, commented on it says that another good one that I didn't include. Might have been the Wotan from the the, the Watan from the uh, from the War Machine. Yes, yes. You know because he said he basically says that, that you know that 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 actual storyline and 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 the computers you know kind of ruining the world. It's probably a lot more cognizant and more relevant now than than, than it was back in the sixties. So true, true. Um, so so they they could actually do a better job and make it more 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 of a frightening story now than they could back then. Sort of thing. Which kind of inspired me to order it on DVD, so I'm, I'm actually going to be doing a retro review of that, maybe later on oh, in the week. Oh. So, um, don't, don't, so that that's that's something to uh to to look ahead to. Um, but talking about uh Doctor Who, we've got um, there's another rumor going around in terms of the thirteenth uh, Doctor. Yes, Chris Marshall, um, who um lately of uh uh. Uh, procedural it was uh, death in paradise that was it the timing is interesting yeah he uh, they the rumor is that not only is he uh the front runner but he's apparently already been cast and that the the regeneration will be occurring 
during the Mondasian Cyberman two-parter instead of the Christmas episode. Ah, so you get to do David Tennant. Yes. That, that'd be interesting. Um, if, if that does pan out to be true, um, he'd actually be a very good doctor. Yes, he he gave me. Um, I, w- I was looking at him. I um, I quit. I quit watching Death in Paradise after Ben Miller left. But I watched him long enough to know, and long enough to know that he would actually. He, he kind of gives off a latter day latter day Peter Davison vibe. Mm, no, I mean Peter Davison's quite straight in comparison to uh, Chris Marshall. To be honest, mm, um, okay. You know, so um, I don't know. I I think he's got his own vibe, mm. to be honest, Marshall. Because um, you know, I I've I've seen him progress. He used to be in in a in a sitcom, and he was in that he was in this sitcom. He played the uh, the oldest teenage son of um, and I think it was you know I can't remember the name of it. Uh, wasn't two point five children or something? I just can't remember the name of it off off, off top That's of okay. right now. But. Um, he he kind of broke into the into into the into into a um, UK into the UK consciousness in in this sitcom that he did. Um, then he kind of popped up again in a um, in that love action film. He played the uh, the horny guy going off to America, you yeah. know, in, and um, and he, he was fun in that. And then the next time I seen him was was Death in Paradise. <laughs> Um, I actually stopped watching Death in Paradise after the uh, after the woman left. Oh, okay, um, yeah, I, I quit. Right, I quit right as they transitioned from Ben Miller because um, Chris Marshall just didn't appeal to me, so I moved on right after they killed off uh, Ben Miller. He, he was actually quite good in Death in Paradise, so you know, I, I'd encourage you to sort of maybe give him another go. Um, but I, I I stopped watching after the after the after the woman left. You know the woman that that was with Ben Miller and she transitioned in with Marshall and she left at the end of uh, Marshall's first series. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, because I kind of really liked her and and um, and her leaving and then Ben Miller leaving in the th- in in the in the in the third series. It was a little bit too much change for me to bear, so I just couldn't go with it after that. Yeah. Um. So. Um. But yeah, he he'd be good. I mean, the, 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 there are other rumours as well. Um, there's a lot of people. Um, I, I was looking at a list of uh, of favourites, and uh, you know we've got Hayley Atwell on there. Um, can't see her doing it, to be honest. No, I. She'd want to do big, it. But my big, my big issue is, I'm sure I'm sure Chris will be absolutely fine relative to what they're going to give him if if it's true. But I was kind of hoping for Patterson Joseph. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of people are hoping for Patterson Joseph because um, he'll be 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 the first Doctor Who of Kunga. Yeah, and and that, we 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 need that as pastime. And frankly. and that that would be cool, you know, to see that. Um, but you know, um, without say, without taking anything away from Chris Marshall, I think he'll make a good fist of it. I think he's kind of like a. As an actor, is is more of a character actor than he is a as, as, as than he is the traditional leading man mm. sort of thing. And and the thing is about uh, the best dot best actors play Doctor Who is they're not traditional leading men. Uh, the reason Peter Davison didn't really work for me was that he was a little bit too much of the traditional leading man. Mm, true, um, in, true. In, in a lot of ways, um, because he, he he went on to play sort of like uh, some. Some quite clever characters. After that, I think the uh, the reason he got dots, he was basically on the strength of him playing the uh, the Quatsy vet in um, in our creatures great and small. Siegfried, yeah, you know, Siegfried. It was on like it was on Tristan. Tristan, Tristan. Sorry, yeah. It was on the strength of his, of his role as as Tristan. I think that he, that he got dots who because you know he could do eccentric and and that sort of thing, but. Um, but for me, the best doctors have not really been your traditional leading man type. I mean, Patrick Troughton wasn't uh, wasn't your traditional leading man type no. sort of thing. He was more 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 renowned for playing different lots of different characters. Um, I mean, someone I'd love to see do it would 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 be Sam Troughton, Patrick Troughton's grandson. Yes, yes, um, yes. But you know, he doesn't really do too much film and television. He's more of a stage actor. Mm. But and I think he'd be awesome as as Doctor Who, you know, irrespective of who his grandfather is, he'd just be awesome. And I, I'd love to see Sean Pertwee, but that's not going to happen because he's busy on Gotham. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Sean Pertwee would be good. I mean, you know, I, I I've seen so much John Pertwee now that I'm kind of over him. Mm. You know, I thought I thought it was good. 
and and yeah. it's all right. But I'm kind of all, all over him. I'm you know I, whereas I'm sort of like watching a lot of Patrick Troughton at the moment and uh, and and have been for a while. And uh, I think you know out of the classic series, uh, Patrick Troughton is my second favorite Doctor behind Tom mm. Baker. Mm. That um, makes sense. That makes sense. But if I was going to do the best Doctor, if I was going to do a best Doctor Who list from worst to best, I'd actually have Patrick Troughton as the best Doctor. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other, the others wouldn't have had a template without him. Pretty, so. pretty, that's that. That'd be pretty much my argument. So I think. Um, I mean, I mean, I, the trouble is we're doing a best, you know, a worst to best Doctor list is sort of like figuring out the order. Colin yes. Baker would probably be the worst, but that's not down to Colin Baker. It's down to the writing and the fact that he had to wear that bloody ridiculous garish jacket. Yes, the amazing Technicolor dream coat that mm-hmm. looked even worse in motion. Yes, yeah. and I, I think I'd probably put William Hartnell as the uh, as the next as the next one down from him. Sadly, you know, that, but then that's not Hartnell's fault either. So. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just that because there's been so many decent performances since him and and, yes. and the character yeah. evolved so much with what Troughton did that, you know, what Hartnell did was great for the time, but, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, it's, it's probably going to be hard, it's probably harder to actually sit some a new, newbie fan down in front of a William, a William Hartnell story than it would be to sit them down in front of a, a Troughton story. True. But you, True. You, you'd have a job sitting them down in front of either of them because... They're in black and white. Yes. And we can't watch anything in black and white because it's like 152 years old or something and it's not good. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. You know, that's sort of like the, uh, the modern audience for you sort yeah. of thing. Oh, the special effects are rubbish. <laughs> of course they're rubbish. It's not the point. Yeah. It's sort of like it's um, it's almost like uh, you know the modern audience now falls more for style over substance. Yeah. Uh, which is sad, but there we go. Yeah. But that that's just only a portion of the modern audience, I guess. But it's it's it seems to be the portion that I seem to be um, to to be sort of like meeting up with a lot. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm having the same problem. Okay, well, uh, moving on from Dot Two and on something slightly still Dot Two, um, I believe you've been you recently sort of like finished watching Class. Yeah, and you they, um, talk about I, they they started Class. They started airing it with the new season of Doctor Who. So I've seen the pilot. I'm assuming it hasn't been renewed, right? I don't think it has. I've not heard anything. Um, okay, I'm I'm not shocked because uh, it's there are a lot of really interesting ideas. But even if they even if they play out, uh, there's a, there's a lot holding it back. It's it, it seemed to be one of those shows where the teen allegory was going to be dumped on our heads um, at the expense of any narrative subtlety. Mm, but yeah, it, it, the guy that wrote it was you know he, he kind of used Buffy as his sort of template. That explains a lot. Um, yeah. I guess because he's he's sort of like he's one he, basically Buffy's kind of started this whole subgenre of writing, which is writing science fiction fantasy that's specifically geared towards a teenage audience or a teenage or audience in their early twenties or something. Mm. And I forget what the what what the subgenre is called now, but um, it, it just sort of like it just seems kind of like to me, um, why can't you just not write? A decent story and, and yeah and, and, not, and let and let the audience decide what the subtext is yeah. on their own because i think i think that's why that's why buffy worked when it was when it was written and made is because it was decent stories likable characters and and stuff like that and, and people of all ages related to it yes um it just so happened that it was mostly people in their teens and and early 20s but you know we had we had a few sort of like you know, people that that were older that I actually enjoyed it as well. So yeah, I, I'm I'm still mourning the fact that that Joss Whedon wasn't able to make the Ripper spin off with BBC like he planned. Yeah, that, that is sad. But then again, if you if you look at what's happened since, um, we've had two great Avengers movies from him, and you know he went on to do Agents of Shield, and we might yeah, not have had, we might not have had Firefly. True, had true. He, had he done that, so you can't kind of have to take the rough with the smooth. Uh, with with class, I actually quite enjoyed it. I thought the acting was fantastic. You know, there was a you know quite a few of the actors. You know, the young actors in that show were were were, were showing acting chops way way above their age. Yeah, and I I think that if if I ignore the teen allegory and just deal with the surface narrative, the surface narrative is looking to be quite interesting. 
Mm. Um, I'm just not, I'm just not going to get attached to it because it's obviously going to get cancelled. Yeah, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. I mean, it's made to BBC Three, and I don't know what BBC Three's expectations are in terms of ratings and stuff like that. Because it's well, now... since BBC Three is going to cease to exist as a terrestrial channel soon, um... it it already has. Mm, okay. It's only available online now. Okay. And uh, has only been available online for um, probably about getting on for a year now. Mm, okay. Um. But, you know, that said, I can actually download BBC programs on BBC free programs onto my TV because I've got a smart box. So, you know. um, but I, I thought it was OK. Um, you know, quite quite like the storyline and, you know, and the characters were quite likeable. And I did add an order to you, and I agree. Yeah, as long as um, you do that, it's 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 watchable. But it was just so like um, when 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 I was watching it, I just had a gut feeling that you know it's not it's not going to do too well. Um, basically, because of the way the BBC treated it, because they shown it on BBC Three, it came out on Saturday. But when they when when they shown it on terrestrial television, the, you know the you know a couple of nights after it aired premiered on 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 the uh on on bbc3 sort of thing they were showing it at like 11 o'clock at night mm. and, and who's going to watch that at 11 o'clock at night it's just not you know it wasn't it wasn't particularly a good time slot for it and for mm, this is just going to get cancelled if that's the way they're treating it mm. well it's, it's 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 further proof that at the end of the day the bbc regardless of what they actually say are pretty much out of the doctor who spin-off business mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a bit worried that they could wind up at being out of the Doctor Who business. Yeah, you know, there is that. If they're not, if they're not, if they're not, if they're not careful with some of the choices they make. Because um, I mean, they're, they're handing more and more. It's a double-edged sword. They're handing more and more of the modern Who characters over to Big Finish, which is awesome because Big Finish is actually treating them right. Mm-hmm. But we're, we're going to be if they keep going the rate they're going, big, we're going to be where we were, where Big Finish is the franchise. Mm. Yeah, but that that probably wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing because True. if if it were to go off the air, it it probably go off the air for a few years, and then then somebody would come to the BBC that was maybe a fan of this generation of the series and want to have a stab at bringing it back, sort yeah. of thing. It's you know these these things go you know go round and round and roundabouts. I mean, you know we got we got a new Star Trek show coming out in 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 September or sometime sometime round about there. Um, heaven knows what it's going to be like. Um, the rumor is that it's, it's going to be kind of like a soft reboot, but set ten years before Kirk. Uh-huh. Um, there's already a lot of fans kicking off because they've changed the the design and the look of the Klingons. I'm not, I'm not really not bothered about that. No, no, I, um, I, 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 want, I just want good scripts. It's you know, point. if it's a good story and if it's a good script and the characters are likable and relatable. And if it if it's so like uh, doing kind of a social allegory, which is what all good Star Trek did, yeah. um, then I, I'm quite happy to go along with it, um, sort of thing. But you know, it's like um, there's, there's a friend of mine called uh, called Gus, Gustav. Now he used to run the uh, run, run Trek Web. Mm-hmm. He hates the new Star Trek movies. Can't stand them. Hates them. Hates Chris Pine. Hates Zachary Quinto. Chris Pine's a rubbish actor. Zachary Quinto's a rubbish actor, in you know, with Carter, according to Gus. He just doesn't like the guy, like, like the, the the way the reboot, you know, the the film franchise are gone. He doesn't like any of the actors. Doesn't like any of the people involved. Always bad mouth in it. Um, and I, I just saw like say to him, you know, what do you mean, Chris Pine isn't a good actor. He's been in loads of stuff. He's he's actually pretty confident, you know. And the, the cast, the cast works, even if the scripts don't. Yeah, yeah, the cast works. I mean, Zachary Quinto's brilliant, you know, and, and yeah. um, Cam Urban's brilliant. I just don't get what he's... But, you know, that said, you know, I think William Shatner's one of his favourite actors, and I'm thinking, well, the bar's pretty old there, isn't it, really? <laughs> you know, not not to badmouth William Shatner because, he, you know, but he's not a str- he's not particularly a strong actor. He's not, no. He, he, he's, 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 a, he's a personality. Yeah. Um, Nimoy was actually a stronger actor. Well, both Nimoy and DeForest Kenny were stronger actors. Yes, you know, and but you, but 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 by the same same conclusion, you don't really need a strong actor uh, to be be the captain. You need a charismatic no. sort. Of, you need a charismatic personality, and that is what they what what they cast in William Shatner. They didn't yeah. cast him necessarily because of acting because of his acting chops. It was probably more because of his char- charisma. Yeah, sort of thing. 
and and that that at the end of the day is what won people over. I think uh-huh. you know um, you know sort of like um, but you know it's I, it's sort of it's sort of funny watching watching the fan responses to it, and I'm I'm just thinking, can you not just sort of like you know take take a take a step back and maybe wait and see if it's any good uh-huh. before you yeah. start bad mouthing it? <laughs> yeah. You know, granted, I'm as upset as the next person that Brian Funger actually chose to leave the project. But at the end of the day, there's still quite a few good people involved in it. You know, so sort of like Rod Roddenberry's thing involved, Nicholas Meyer's thing involved, you know? So. Yeah, as, as, long as, as, as long as Meyer's still there, we're, we're going to be relatively okay. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I mean, sort of like, um, we're, we're not the uh, Star Trek, was not Star Trek 2 a soft reboot of Toss? Yeah. In a lot of ways. It was. You know? Yeah. So. It's, and, and the Klingons, if you look at the Klingons in Star Trek the motion picture and then look at them in, in, in when when they reappear in Star Trek three. Yeah, it's you know, worlds it's worlds different. So. It's worlds different. So it's you know, so I'm I'm kind of like uh, I, I'm I'm in wait and see mode. Yeah. And getting back onto the T V subjects of, of today, we talk we talked about dot two. Uh now I think the other big ones, Agents of Shield. Oh, Oh, yes, and the 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 tie-in there is Anne de Castiger, mm-hmm. the, the the British actor who is wowing. I I first actually saw Anne de Castiger before Agents of Shield because I'm one of the people who watched a short-lived series he did called The Fades. Yeah, I've got that on the I've got that on Blu-ray somewhere, knocking about. Brilliant, br- brilliant freaking series. Um, the mm. it, it was another one, another one of those that had some, a lot of teen allegory going for it, but the teen allegory handled was handled in that one a little more effectively. And uh, and Ian DeCastiker showed chops beyond his years. I mean, serious range on this kid. And so when I saw that he was cast on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I was already excited just because I knew he had range and that we would get some, some above average stuff. And he um, has not disappointed. He, he's been brilliant as Fritz, as Fitz in this. You know, I just kind of love the transition oh. from... You know, relatively sort of like innocent, sort of like a geeky nerd who wants to wants to think the best of people, to sort of like um, to to sort of like megalomaniac Frankenstein type scientist. Yeah, and apparently um, Ada achieved that effect by removing he re- she he re- she removed one. Um, one regret from each of the characters, mm-hmm. and so the the question is, what was Fitz's regret that she removed? And I th- I'm beginning to wonder if part of him, at least subconsciously, regrets saving Gemma because they're constantly on this merry-go-round where they're losing each other and having to go across the universe to find each other. And I'm wondering if, if subconsciously, uh, what they're going to have to work through when they get out of the framework is. He's just he just doesn't want to be on that you know star-crossed lovers uh, merry-go-round with her anymore. Yeah, but they you know let's face it, they've not really been on it this season. In 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 so far as star-crossed lovers, they've actually been a pretty solid couple this season until till the framework. Yeah, but I think um, one of the things he, that he brought up, I think toward the end of the LMD arc, was that he he, they, he had been living in in constant fear that they were going to lose each other again. Mm. And I think subconsciously he's dealing with that by just going, let me permanently lose her so I don't have to worry about the yo-yo effect anymore. Yeah, well, yeah. maybe he can hook up with Yomo, but y- Yodo, but I think Mac would have something to say about that. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I actually, I, I actually really enjoyed the, you know, the, you know, the the, the stuff with Fitz, but I also in this last episode that's just there. Uh, I love the stuff with Mac and, and oh, his little yes. girl hold. Yeah. And... He's, he's awesome. And, and Henry Simmons has been owning it as Mac since he came in. Um, mm. he, he's, a, he's another one with real range. And, uh, and I, I, I love the fact that he's, he actually gets to you know live with his daughter for a little while, but that's going to be heartbreaking when the time comes. Oh, that's that's going to be really heartbreaking. Uh, I'm kind of loving uh, Agent Coulson as a, as a geeky teacher. <laughs> yes. Yes, and you know you kind of see you kind of look at the wise and grizzled Agent Coulson that we're used to, and then you see that, and you think, "Whoa!" Yeah. Showing the trailer for next week's Got Two at the moment on TV. So I'm watching oh. it on the sound. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, yeah. 
but no, it, it's proof that Clark Gregg has also got chops because he's he's adding adding shades to Coulson that you wouldn't you wouldn't think. Yeah, but and, you know, Coulson was always kind of geeky anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you look at the year at at Coulson when he was first introduced in Iron Man. True. You know, and and then 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 in the uh, first Avengers movie, you know, he's connect, he, he's making a big deal about connecting baseball cards of Captain America. He's always oh. been sort of like a geek. Yeah, <laughs> sort yeah. Of thing. Or you know, so so that 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 element of the character has always been there. But why why I'm loving is the fact that he's now a nervous geek. <laughs> yes, yes. And then and then of course there's um Patriot. Mace Mace actually getting to be something like the resistance leader is kind of awesome too. Mm-hmm. Um given his arc up to this point. Yeah, Jason O'Mar is actually really Jason impressed. Omar. Yes. Jason O'Mar he's really impressed me in this series. Um I mean, I I kind of like first encountered him when they when when the American in the American version of Life on Mars, mm. and you know it was kind of like um, he felt wooden in that role. You know, it, it just mm. I just wasn't convinced. And the same again when 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 he was in when when he was in sort of like uh, Terra Nova a few mm. years later, he, you know he he felt kind of a bit wooden in, in that role. But in in the role that he's playing at the moment, you know, he's he's actually shown shown show me something that I didn't really see in those previous two things. So you know, so sort of like he, what what he's done in Agents of Shield has actually changed my opinion of of, of him as an actor. Wow, yeah, good. And then of course there's Mallory Jansen as Ada slash Madam Hydra. Um, she's she's another one that I expected big things from because I had watched her play the villainous in uh, the two-season musical Gallivant, during which she displayed real range. So when she mm-hmm. was cast as as Ada, I knew immediately that they were going to be doing something above average with that entire arc, because this is a woman with, with real range, and they wouldn't just cast her as a, a run-of-the-mill android. And mm-hmm. she's she's proven me right. Oh, this has been awesome. Okay, well, you know, um, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how they actually conclude this arc. I mean, how many episodes are left now, do you think? I can't remember. I, I lost count. It's it's somewhere between... It's, it ends in May, so... Right. So we're probably going to have a, another week off, maybe. Yeah, so, so like five or six. I think they got like five or six left mm-hmm. that they're going to do. Uh, yeah, well, um, to round this off, I seen the uh, series finale, season finale of MacGyver. Uh, y- yes, I, I read your review of it. I, I had forgotten that David Dasmachian, who plays uh, Murdoch, also played um, and is now established as Abracadabra on The Flash. Mm-hmm. And Abracadabra is more along the lines of what Murdoch should be. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't actually make that connection myself, but you know, I think he's. I, I think for this version of Murdoch, he's doing a pretty good job of it. Yeah. yeah. It's just that you know, you know, they've reimagined the series so much. Like I said in my review, what they need to do is sort of like get rid of Jack Dalton and let MacGyver go off on his own. Yes. Um, you know, there was a bit at the beginning where I thought Jack Dalton was going to die, and I was thinking, please kill him, please kill him, please kill him. But you know, they they disappoint me again. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you you get the sense that if if Lucas Till was left on his own, he could play a credible variation, a credible modern variation of that character. But uh, they're just not letting him do it. They're, they're not, and you know, so sort of like. Um, I mean, Bowser doesn't get on my nerves as much now. Um, Bowser's actually had quite a lot of character growth this series, in, in the series, you know. But it's just sort of like, um, it's too much like Hawaii Five-0 and NCIS at the moment with, with the with the whole whole sense of team and family, whereas the, the whole point of MacGyver is he, he was a lone operative. Yes. You know, he, he, he was sent in to, to uh, he was sent in onto missions in which so like small cells and small teams had actually been in and failed. He was usually sent in to rescue what was left of those of those teams. Yes, sort of thing, yes. And it'd be and it'd be and it, and, it, and they and they had, you know, a recurring cast, but they were a recurring cast, with the exception of Dana Elkar May Rest. Yeah. Uh 
and and they worked as recurring casts. I mean, um, to show you how far back, that back we go, I mean, we were aware of um, Terry Hatcher prior to Lois and Clark because she played Penny the, Parker. Penny Parker, who, yeah. and I and I loved her as Penny Parker. She was playing what, what, what was at the time a contemporary variation of, of, of the you know perils of Pauline character so that he would have somebody who was needed rescuing. And I thought she was she made a, a very good variation of that. Yeah, and, and she actually she actually you know, Penny Parker in the she she actually shown quite a bit of growth as as as, as she progressed in the series. She actually yeah, she, grew, did. she she actually grew in confidence and to to eventually she became someone that could pretty much stand on her own two feet without <laughs> too much of MacGyver's input. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, I mean, Jack Dalton, the reason I hate this new version of Jack Dalton, because George Eads isn't half the actor of, of, of the guy that they actually had playing Jack Dalton. Bruce McGill, what's Bruce the term? McGill. You know, and, not as good. You know, nowhere near as good. And yeah. and it's it's the whole turning Jack Dalton into, um, into a wise, cracking uh, country music listening... Um, Bruce Willis admiring sort of like a uh, hunky sort of like SEAL Team 6 sort of guy you know yeah. a SEAL Team 6 sort of guy would be a lot more intense than Jack Dalton than, than this version of Jack Dalton is I was going to say it just doesn't work it doesn't work <laughs> no as, as, as a characterization, it's sort of like it's it's kind of like um, the, the, the thing that I loved about Jack Dalton is he, he was kind of like a pathetic loser yes he, he was very specifically written that way, and then and you, you got the sense as the as the original series progressed that Mac was a magnet for those guys. Yeah, and, and and that was okay. Mac was fine with that. He he almost recognized it as his karmic reality. You know that he was going to attract those folks, mm-hmm. and and you got the sense even with the original version of of, of Murdoch played so awesomely by Michael DeBar. Um, th- this was the MacGyver universe was inhabited by people who had trouble getting through their own lives exactly. and, and were only better when they gravitated toward each other. And that even, and that even applied to, and that even applied to the villain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the actors did a much more credible job of conveying all that. And like, and from, from what I've seen of the, the limited episodes, I've had the stomach to watch of the new series. Yeah, I mean, the bright spark of the new series is Matty. Yes, you said. You know, at first I didn't like, I didn't, I didn't actually like her, but by the time I'd seen her in the second episode, she actually grew on me very, very, mm. very, very quickly. And I kind of thought, you know, she had a few scenes with Lucas Turner as MacGyver, and I thought, well, there's actually potential here to to do sort of like um, a reversal on 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 the on on the MacGyver. Uh, Pete Thornton relationship, but you know, just have have Matty be that Pete Thornton character because she she's skeptical about uh, MacGyver's methods and and the fact that he improvises. Yeah, and and, and then when they when they introduced um, when they introduced partners, which was the episode where they also introduced Murdoch, and they had a whole big flashback. Um, Pete Thornton started out that way. It's like, oh my god, are we actually doing this? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, but you know, the Pete Thornton actually had the benefit of being on on that mission with MacGyver, so we got to see what MacGyver could do. Yeah, that's and, true. You know, and and we got to see the very real time reaction of Pete. So I can't believe this guy's doing this. What's he doing? You know, yeah, yeah. You know, using shoelaces to sort of keep the accelerator pedal down. What what the hell's going on here? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, whereas we've not had that moment yet with Matty, and I'm so wanting them to do that moment where she actually sees MacGyver improvise something together to get them out of a jam so you know i mean i don't mind them keeping bowser and the and and, and the rangy character but I, I just think that they need to sort of like put these other characters to the background and and let lucas till you know do his thing and go go with it because i think he could be a credible you know a credible macgyver you know if, if, yeah. they, if they gave him the chance to but the writers seemingly the, the seeming locked in this or like whole sense of team family sort of thing you know and it's it, it just doesn't you know the show the show's called MacGyver not team MacGyver yeah yeah but the the last episode it was okay you know it was okay um it's just they, they needed to kill Jack Dalton at the beginning of it or, <laughs> or somewhere in it and I, I would have been very very happy <laughs> 
you know, or, or you know, fire him for the Phoenix Foundation and let him get a job driving a taxi, <laughs> you know, which would tag you well with the, the original. But I think that's about it for this week. Um, you know, we've got some we've got some things lined up, um, but I can't really say anything just yet because I don't want to jinx it. But we, we do have a have a few things coming up. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, the DC Action Hour will be back. Yes, taking a bit of a break. Yep, it's taking a bit of a break while the series is offline. Um, and I, I, I think they that they they are planning to have a few guests on at some point. So they they might have a few more guests coming up. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, it's just so like we there's stuff in the works. Um, it might come off for this season, but it might be the next season of the of the show. Um, and as for genre um I think Marts has quite a few things in the works, but you know, um, not 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 quite yet. So, but there are there are things uh, happening um, here at Sci-Fi Pulse Radio. We've actually improved the website for Sci-Fi Pulse Radio dot com. Awesome. And while I'm saying that, I hear Raisa typing in the URL to have a look. <laughs> <laughs> It does look better. It looks cleaner. So, you know, mm-hmm. I'll get your comment on it later. Uh, but yeah. that's about it for this week. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll be back at you real soon. Bye. Bye.